know Thomas Arnold, if you've ever read Lytton Strachey's great book, Eminent Victorians, he's one of the four Victorian white sepulchers who's caricatured there. But for once, he was, his conscience worked properly on, on the uh, opium wars. And he said, quote, This war with China really seems to me so wicked as to be a national sin of the greatest possible magnitude, and it distresses me very deeply. I really do not remember in any history a war undertaken with such combined injustice and baseness. Ordinary wars of conquest are to me less wicked than to go to war in order to maintain smuggling, and that smuggling consisting of the introduction of a demoralizing drug which the government of China wishes to keep out, and which we, for gain, wish to introduce by force. And that is a pretty good summary of what the opiate wars were about. So I'll explain how this all came about. And you have to be willing to see the 19th century fresh. Uh, you have to be willing to understand that the, the world was controlled by this monstrous entity, uh, a, a profit-based British Empire and its little bully sidekick, France. Uh, and that's France's role in this, I'm ashamed to say, just the bully sidekick. Uh, and, and sort of driven by the, the, uh, the East India Company, the British East India Company. Yeah. Right? I mean, which, you know, it is essentially a government. Um, it, yeah. it, and it's uh, indemnified against, you know, the, the shareholders get indemnified against certain liabilities. They unionize together and create essentially a private government within a public government on a charter. Yep. On a charter, and we have to remember, you know, that when you hear about oh, a company was chartered, it's the reason why they were chartered is because they had to prove up until you know 100 years until the Industrial Revolution, they always had to prove that they were actually serving a public good. Uh, granted, right. they, they probably never were, but but that was the theory that, that they would get renewed every 10 or 20 years, and that was certainly upheld more in America because the East India Company was the company that that uh, colonists rebelled against here. That was what the Tea Party was about. It was right. about their monopoly on uh, on tea, um, and uh, the colonists rebelled against it. And it's kind of ironic that the Republicans and the Koch brothers launched a tea party against government because that was really against oh. the, the East India. Yeah, but, but you're assuming that any of those I people know know, know any, anything about this. But it's very interesting that tea is going to come into this yes. story too in a really important way. Um, there are some constants. There's some things that keep coming back into these stories. Um, so. Through, by the late 18th century, British control a lot of India, and they control the rest indirectly through bribery and threats. So basically, the British control India. India is a very complicated political landscape, but, but they can do what they want. And when we say the British, we don't mean, um, as, as you were saying, we don't mean a government. We mean the British East India Company. It is a company. It right. can do what it wants for profit. For profit. It's its only goal is profit for the shareholders and included in its shareholders of course are numerous government people so it kind yep. of goes in a circle yep yeah it has a lot of constituencies among them second sons um, Britain has a lot of second sons and India is a great place to get rid of them and the more brutal and stupid they are the better uh, you unleash all that uh, testosterone on uh, the unlucky people in the colony and it keeps it out of the home country which is very handy for colonial power. So the <laughs> the British are trying to find a way to control China as they control India. I mean, we're talking about the centers of human civilization. Uh, the rest of us are really just an outgrowth. Human civilization is a product of South and East Asia, and they control South Asia directly. They want to control East Asia, China as well. The trouble is, though, China has retained its independence, unlike India. And it's, it's a world unto itself. It's so culturally and economic self-sufficient that the British don't have anything to sell that China actually wants. Uh, the British are having to buy huge quantities of tea from China. I mean, the, the slogan, all the tea in China, comes from the massive quantities of tea that, uh, China, that the British were, and others were, were shipping out of China. But they, those ships come into China empty. And to a free marketeer, whether it's 2016 or um, 1840, that is the greatest sin of all. You know, you're wasting all those transport costs on empty vessels coming into China. 
Well, and you're also I mean, creating a, a trade deficit. Right. And, and, right. That, and then that becomes a, a problem, you know, that, that can become another problem about it. It's being talked about in the yeah. elections today. Um, right. And then also, of course, there's the fact that the, the, the Chinese didn't, they weren't gold bugs. To them, gold yep. was just a shiny gold metal. You can have it. They wanted silver and the British didn't have silver. Right, Did right. The Spanish had silver, but by this time the Chinese had all the silver they could yeah. possibly want, and the Spanish were gone. So uh, there, there is something that a free marketeer... The Paju Pagoda is an octagonal, pavilion-style pagoda with blue brick masonry. It has 17 stories. Eight stories are underground and nine above ground. The Opium Wars really is a war fought on behalf of, of, of free enterprise and companies, uh, uh, you know, and, and we have this idea today that somehow private corporations, that, that governments have, it's, what's the cliche, governments have a monopoly on violence and coercion. Um, yeah. India was the property of a corporation, the British East India Company, and it was that corporation's drive to find a market in China that led to pretty much the destruction of China, and it was that company's drive to maintain its monopoly that led to unbelievable slaughters in India during the so-called mutiny. Mm -hmm. So if anybody ever had any ideas that corporations can't commit mass murder on the scale uh, attributed to governments, well, it's because the view we have of, of 19th century history is really wrong. And I guess if there's there's something I want to stress about this broadcast, if what we've been told about 19th century history is dead wrong. For some reason, there are these massive horrors that, that are just not discussed. They're acknowledged. If you uh, bring them up, you'll get a sort of acknowledgement in uh, perfunctory terms that, oh, yes, yes, some, some uh, excesses were committed. But they're not moralized. I mean, some yeah. slaughters are moralized and some are not. It's very strange and it makes you a little frightened when, when you really look into it carefully. So if you wanted to break into a market where the people don't crave anything uh, that you have, well, let's see, what creates a craving? How about an addictive drug? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, what could, what could be a faster way to create a craving than an addictive drug? Uh, the British happen to control huge areas of opium producing uh, land in India and so the obvious solution to their problem if you don't have any conscience is to force opium on China because it's a guaranteed market uh, once people start taking opium they'll have to keep taking opium or they'll be in agony China had made opium illegal the Chinese word for opium was foreign mud or uh, alien smoke there were all these pejoratives for it they, they were very wisely afraid of it mm -hmm. and they didn't want it in their country at all an addictive drug is like the perfect free market product it's incredible um, yeah. you, you can't lose yeah. they signed the Treaty of Nanking uh, in which the, the Chinese have to pay a huge amount of money for, for daring to try to stop uh, the opium dealers. And Britain also gets a, a particularly humiliating uh, concession from China called extraterritoriality, which means British subjects in China are immune to Chinese law. They can only be handed over to British authorities. So if you a British citizen kills a Chinese, uh, it can't be tried in Chinese courts. And the results of the victory are that opium use boom in China. And this will go on for the rest of the 19th century to the point by the beginning of the 20th century, China was the consumer of 95% of world opium production. The view we have of, of 19th century history is really wrong.